Okay, let's go ahead and put this week in the books. So we left off talking uh, some introductory material about viruses. And so I, I promised you that we would go through the Baltimore system. And before we go through the Baltimore system, let me just say this very plainly. You do not need to memorize the Baltimore system. I actually have a video, but I can't, it's too damn long. I have a video of David Baltimore, the guy who designed this, giving a seminar. And in the middle of it, he gets confused and actually says, I can never remember this system. So if the guy who invented it can't remember the Baltimore system, I don't think it's fair to expect you to. But it's nice to go through it just for an appreciation point of view because virology is incredibly complex because of all of the different um, gymnastics, if you will, that the genetic material can go through in terms of being DNA or RNA, being single-stranded or double-stranded, being plus sense or minus sense. Hopefully, it will become more clear, not as we go through just talking about these different classes, but as we go through the individual viruses that, that we'll talk about. So just kind of bear with me for this. There are some important points here, but for the most part, think of this more in terms of appreciation of the complexity of, of viruses. So this is the Baltimore system in its, in its simplest form. So there are seven different types of viruses. And so you look through them and you see they, they range from <laughs> double-stranded DNA viruses, so things that have genetic material much like yours or, or mine, um, through things that have RNA as a genome. And so I put some stars by the RNA genomes because RNA genomes are something that cells don't have. And so you and I don't have, as far as I know, a enzymatic activity that allows us to make an RNA copy of an RNA template. We make RNA copies of DNA templates. That's DNA, DNA polymerase. We make RNA polymerase. We make DNA copies of DNA templates. But for the most part, as far as I know, and I think there are some eukaryotic cells that can do this, but I think at least in terms of multicellular organisms, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase is just not an activity. It's just not a thing. But in viruses that, are, that have as their genetic material double-stranded RNA, single-stranded RNA in either the positive sense or the, or the minus sense, at some point, either for gene expression, either to make messenger RNA or to replicate their genome, they must have um, something known as um, viral replicase. So we use the term viral replicase, and in your mind, that will always be, have an equal sign after it to RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. It's a very unusual property for, for cellular organisms. So, so Diane Shakes has told me that there are um, some, some worms, like I think C. elegans actually has an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase activity. But until she told me that, I'd never, I'd never heard of that being in a multicellular organism. So, Again, looking at the, the entire complexity, the entire range of the, of the Baltimore system, going from class one all the way and actually coming back to, to class seven, the, the most interesting ones in, in my mind um, are the RNA viruses. But in, in many of these RNA viruses, especially in the double-stranded RNA virus, so, this, so as an example, of a double-stranded RNA virus that you may be familiar with. As a matter of fact, I guarantee every one of you has been infected by it. Rotavirus, the virus that's very famous for causing um, infantile diarrhea. There are about eight different species of rotaviruses. These are um, within the family rheovirus, but they are double-stranded <coughs> RNA viruses. In veterinary medicine, there are a lot more rheoviruses, a lot more double-stranded RNA viruses to be concerned with. But for the most part, when I think of human health, and double-stranded RNA viruses, I always think of parvo, excuse me, not parvo, but uh, rotavirus. But in any case, that virus, the double-stranded RNA virus, as well as the negative strand RNA viruses, so an, in, an example of that is influenza. We'll go through influenza in great detail, so you'll, you'll see the point that I'm about to make. But in those two types of RNA viruses, those viruses, upon infection of a new cell, have to bring that viral replicase um, into the cell that's being infected preformed. The enzyme has to be there. Because as it turns out, double-stranded RNA, 
the genome of a rotavirus or the negative sense RNA, the genome of influenza, cannot be translated by a host cell when it gets infected. So, so if, a, if a virus dumps double-stranded RNA into the cytoplasm of your cell or my cell, our ribosomes can't touch it. It can't make proteins from that. So if that virus has any hope of uh, expressing itself, it needs to transcribe the minus strand, in this case of the double-stranded RNA, to make plus-strand mRNA. That can actually be translated. But this step, transcription of the minus strand, into a positive strand is done by that viral replicase, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. But in this particular case, the double-stranded RNA <coughs> virus, as well as the negative sense single-stranded RNA virus, that enzyme has to be there at the moment of infection. That's not the case for viruses like poliovirus. We'll talk about polio as our example of a, of a coronavirus. You're probably much more familiar and have been infected much more frequently with rhinoviruses. Rhinoviruses are in the same family as poliovirus, called the coronaviruses. But these viruses, even though they are a single-stranded RNA genome, so they must at some point use viral replicase, they have to be able to make a copy of this plus-stranded genome in order to put a genome into new viruses, little cute baby viruses that are going to leave that cell. They don't need it at the time of infection because the genome of a virus like poliovirus, because it's positive sense, it's in the same orientation. It is, in fact, messenger RNA. So poliovirus, as its genome is injected into a host cell, is messenger RNA. So it can be translated into proteins. One of those proteins is viral replicase. That viral replicase will then take that positive strand messenger RNA and make the antisense strand, in effect, what's called the antigenome. It will make a negative sense strand that it can then turn around and make RNA copies of to make much more messenger RNA. So it's a little bit of an inane point. But remember that these three types of RNA viruses need to have viral replicase, all of them. Two of them need to have that viral replicase preformed at the moment of infection. There's another RNA virus that you're all um, familiar with down, down here. These are the single, this is a single-stranded RNA virus of the positive sense, but this is retrovirus. This genome, as it would be um, put into a cell, is exactly the same orientation as a poliovirus. In theory, a retrovirus genome could be translated into proteins directly as it goes into, the, into a cell. It's not. Retroviruses, and we'll talk about HIV in great detail, have an elaborate system whereby they turn their single-stranded RNA into DNA. So that's, why, that's where the term retrovirus comes from. This is the actual um, reason why David Baltimore won the Nobel Prize, was he discovered the fact that retroviruses could take an RNA genome, turn it into double-stranded DNA, insert that DNA into the host chromosome, and from that point, messenger RNA is made. And you'll see why when we talk specifically uh, about HIV. And I think, um, yeah, I, of course, as I always do, I've gotten ahead of my bullets. This is the point that I've just been harping on for the past few minutes. In two of these classes, the class three and class five, and again, remember, I will never put down on an exam question saying, how does, how does a type Baltimore type 3 replicate? I would say something like, a Baltimore type 3 virus, parentheses, um, double-stranded RNA virus, how does it replicate? So remember that the type 3 and type 5, in order to make the positive strand, have to have that replicase preformed at the time of infection. And again, just to confuse matters a little bit more, or maybe this clears it up, maybe I should have just quit while I, while I had you only semi-confused. Here's a slide that actually shows um, how these different viruses with their different genomes both accomplish replication of their genetic material as well as the gene expression. 
So for instance, the simplest are the double-stranded DNA viruses, things like herpes viruses, pox viruses. Um, these viruses um, replicate their DNA the same way that you and I replicate our DNA. So when you learn to DNA replication, you know all you need to know about this type of virus replication. The same thing with the synthesis of messenger RNA. It's a transcription by RNA polymerase of the negative strand to make messenger RNA. But you see as these other viruses that have these very unusual makeups to their, to their genomes, they have to do different things, like the Baltimore class 2. This is a single-stranded, I can't read from there, this is a single-stranded DNA genome. That genome has to be, if it's positive sense, has to be um, transcribed into a negative sense strand that can then be retranscribed to make the original genome. But then that other, that, that strand that's transcribed is actually the messenger RNA. So as you look through these things, the arrows within the box indicate how it is that the viral genome is replicated. And then the origin of this arrow going to messenger RNA indicates how gene expression occurs. So for instance, this is here, this class 4, this is a positive sense RNA genome. This would be like the polio virus. That plus-stranded RNA genome can be and is used directly as messenger RNA. But in order to replicate, to make more genomes for new little baby viruses, that positive-strand RNA genome is first transcribed into a negative sense strand, referred to as the anti-genome, because it's the exact copy of the genome at the RNA level, but now it's anti-sense. That has no biological function except to serve as a template for viral replicates to turn around and make more positive strands. You'll see this when we talk about poliovirus, but the synthesis of a new strand from the anti-genome makes more genomes, but it's also magnifying the amount of messenger RNA. So this is how the virus makes many, many copies of itself to use as messenger RNA to synthesize large amounts of protein. So as you go through this, just remember that the arrow within the box is indicating how these different genomes replicate themselves, and then look for the other arrow going to the messenger RNA, look for the origin of that arrow, and that tells you what, um, the, how the messenger RNA is, is made. Okay. Now, as I mentioned in these things, I want you to understand about viral replicates, but in terms of the Baltimore system, don't sweat it you will always be told, you know, what happens with a single-stranded RNA virus of the negative sense. You don't need to know, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head right now without the slide in front of me, what that Baltimore class is. So, so don't, don't, you know, worry too much about the systems. Okay, so now what I want to do is, is to talk about bacteriophage, or bacterial viruses. Um, this is a, here, here's a sad story about my training in microbiology. When I was sitting where you are, of course, it was at the University of Maine, but when I took an undergraduate course, my first undergraduate course in microbiology, the only thing I remember from that class is my professor saying this, big bugs have little bugs upon their backs to bite them, little bugs have smaller bugs ad infinitum. He didn't credit it. For years, I thought this professor, who I didn't remember any science from, uh, was really clever and had come up with that. And I was pissed off years later when I was at a seminar and somebody put up this quote and they actually gave the proper attribution, or so they thought, Jonathan, Jonathan Swift. Well, I didn't go to a liberal arts school like you guys do, so you probably know something about Jonathan Swift. I had to look it up. I heard the name. But it turns out Jonathan Swift was in the like 16th, 17th century. He didn't know anything about viruses, let alone, let alone bacteria. <laughs> the actual quote of Jonathan Swift comes from his book called Poetry and Rhapsody. So this is your liberal arts education paying off for you right now. So naturalists observe a flea has smaller fleas that on him prey, and these have smaller still to, bat em, to bite them, and so proceed ad infinitum. So that's the actual, that's the actual quote from, from Jonathan Swift. But it's still um, appropriate, because 
We've been spending a lot of time talking about bacteria and how bacteria are small and oftentimes parasitic upon us or other organisms. Now we're going to talk about viruses that are parasitic upon them. And we already have a little bit. Um, so here's a cute little GIF that I have, or GIF, however you pronounce those things. Um, and you can see a little virus um, contracting and shooting his or her DNA into, into that cell. Viruses don't have gender. Sorry. Um, but, and we talked about this a, a little bit. So, so this virus is meant to represent an E. coli virus that we won't talk in detail about because we don't want to take that much time on this. But T4. So it, it, it binds to specific membrane proteins on, on the outer membrane of E. coli and injects its DNA. And here's that eclipse uh, process that I talked about before. So early on in the infection, if you were at, after allowing T4 to infect E. coli, no matter whether you burst the cells open or looked in the supernatant, you would not find any infectious viruses. It's because of this process of eclipse where the virus actually comes into two parts. You know, now, it's, it, all of its parts are still there. They're not just together anymore. So this portion, as of now, is non-infectious. The genomic DNA is not infectious. So you have a period of eclipse where there's no virus any place, no matter how hard you look. The eclipse period is part of a slightly longer period called the latent period. The latent period um, includes the time where there is no virus extracellular. So if you do this infection in E. coli and you're just looking at the supernatant for viruses, during the latent period you'll never find a virus. But during the, the portion of the latent period starting here, look at this, what this blue line is representing is intracellular virus. If you burst open the E. coli at this point, you would find viruses put together inside of there. So the latent period just means that portion where the viruses haven't been released. Then, if you look at this red line, the red line is tracing the number of viruses that are free in the environment. So at this time point, some of the E. coli cells are beginning to burst. They're beginning to release these, these cute little baby viruses into the environment. And so you'll see that the titer, or the number of uh, bacteriophage, will increase over time until it, until it hits a plateau. So the distance between um, zero and the number of bacteriophage at the maximum is referred to as the burst size. So this is the number, this is a measure of the number of phage that are released from an individual bacterium when it lysis. And that varies, excuse me, tremendously between bacteria. It can be 10, it can be 100 or more. So it just all depends on the, on the virus. So just in terms of semantics or definitions, just remember that burst size is that uh, number of viruses that are released upon lysis of the cells. We're not going to talk about RNA viruses of bacteria, because there aren't that many. Most of the bacteriophage um, that have been explored in microbiology and bacteriology tend to be double-stranded DNA viruses. So we're going to talk almost exclusively, or yeah, really exclusively, about double-stranded DNA viruses in terms of bacteriophage. But there are RNA viruses, and as a matter of fact, I may have mentioned this before, I don't think this is coming out particularly well, but this is the f plasmid. So I'd love to show you these dirty pictures of E. coli having sex with a sex pillus. In reality, that sex pillus is not as big as the E. coli would, would have you believe. In fact, the only reason that you're seeing it in those electron micrographs is because it's literally coated with hundreds and hundreds of a little RNA virus called MS2. This is a, an RNA virus which has adapted itself to infect only F positive cells. And remember, F-positive cells are those cells with the F-plasmid, which is itself a genetic parasite. In my estimation, a highly evolved virus. So now here's a virus that has evolved such that it can only infect cells that are already parasitized by this F-plasmid, because it will bind to the F-plasmid and inject its RNA genome into this um, conjugal tube, so that the cells, both the recipient and the, the donor are now going to be lysed by, the, by this very small RNA bacteria virus. This has one of the smallest known genomes of, of viruses. But we won't talk any more anymore about that. It's just kind of a, an interesting aside. Now, in terms of these double-stranded 
excuse me, double-stranded DNA bacteriophage, about which we know the most, um, T4 and T7, T standing for type um, viruses, and the numbers just reflecting the order in which, actually, it used to reflect the order in which they were discovered, but there was a realignment, such that now the T-even bacteriophage, so T2, T4, T6, are all similar. And the odd viruses, T1, 3, 5, and 7, are, are similar. So they, they used to be in order, but they've been changed. But these are probably two of the best studied E. coli phage. And actually, they're very much used in biotechnology as well, or at least portions of them. So the T4 bacteriophage has this very classic um, lunar lander. You guys weren't alive for the Apollo missions, but I was a kid, and I was very excited about this. But this is very much what looked like what landed on the moon. Um, so it has this icosahedral head. It's an extended icosahedron because T4 has such a large genome that it's put an extra row of proteins onto here. As opposed to the T7, which we'll talk about in just a second, the T7 bacteriophage down here at the bottom, which has a more classic icosahedron. Uh, it has a smaller genome, so it doesn't need as much, much room. But as well as having that um, very large icosahedral capsid, it has this contractile tail. So here's the helical portion of it. And when this cell infects, what happens is that this um, contractile tail twists on itself. And it actually, um, kind of like a spring, tightens up. And so it shortens up. And what that does is it drives a protein piston down through the membrane of the bacterium, um, releases an enzyme, lysozyme, we talked about that one a little bit. Remember, lysozyme is an enzyme that we have in our tears and in our saliva to help break down peptidoglycan. So the bacteriophage have adopted the ability or, um, to help them lyse, that they'll inject a little bit of that enzyme lysozyme through here to help melt or, or break down some of the peptidoglycan to help it actually inject all the way into the cytoplasm of, of the cell. So this is a contractile um, organ. And so this family is referred to as the myoviridae, myo referring to muscle. This is not at all related to the protein myosin in, in muscles, but it does have the contractile ability. So, so hence the term myoviridae. As opposed to T7, which is another very well studied form of bacteriophage in E. coli. It's also a double-stranded DNA genome, but it's of a different um, family called podoviridae. It's called Potoviridae because it has a very small tail. It kind of looks like a tick. Um, or here in this electron micrograph, it always kind of reminds me of a turtle swimming through the creme d'ail. Um, but this doesn't have a contractile tail. Hence, it doesn't fall into the family of Myoviridae. But it has a smaller genome. Uh, but it still has these little um, six little feet. Kind of like the, um, the bacteriophage T4 have. When these viruses bind to E. coli... For instance, um, so T4 and T7 are both referred to as coliphage, in, in, meaning that they will infect E. coli, even though there's some promiscuity, T7 will infect some related bacteria as well. Um, the attachment of the bacteria is via those tail fibers. And in T4, there are six of them. And the receptor that they use in E. coli is a protein that you're also very, very familiar with already. It's OMPC. OMPC, meaning the outer membrane protein that's associated in the colon, or that's most highly expressed in the colon, um, is actually what these little feet bind to. And as one leg or one foot binds to one OMPC, it's not enough to, to induce infection, because that could happen by random chance. It might find a protein on a bacterium that's unrelated to E. coli that has maybe enough similarity to bind. Instead, what the virus has done is evolved the ability to now cooperatively bind. So when one foot or one leg binds to one OMPC, um, that increases the frequency that the second one will bind to another OMPC if, if it's truly an E. coli. After all, six of these feet have found the receptor, in this case, the outer membrane protein C, that will induce that helical portion of the virus to contract upon itself, to initiate in infection. So binding of these tail fibers is ultimately is what's going to drive that infection. So when all of the six tail fibers are bound, that's going to transmit the information 
um, that's going to cause that helical plate to contract to inject the double-stranded DNA in, into the cell. So here's just some electron micrographs uh, of E. coli cells that, were, that have been infected. So this is actually not an experimental. This, this was actually taken from, li from intestinal um, contents of, I believe, a mouse. But um, you can see various E. coli in here. Here's one that's dividing. Here's, here's an E. coli uh, at about a mature size. But you can see these little um, viruses attached to them. So it gives you a good appreciation for how small these um, entities are and how many of them can bind to E. coli. Turns out our intestinal tracts are just absolutely chock-a-block filled with viruses. So, so there are bacteriophage in there um, chewing up bacteria at, at a pretty high rate. But in this particular um, scanning electron micrograph, there are no lytic cells yet. Here, um, in this one, you can see um, a dead cell. So the E. coli cell has been just eviscerated. Remember the movie Alien, where the, like, the monster comes out of the chest of somebody? It's kind of like that. At some point in the infectious process, the bacteria are lysed. They, so they're chewed up by enzymes produced by the bacteriophage. And they just, by osmotic pressure, will, will burst like this and release lots of viruses in, into the environment. So, so here's a, a newly eviscerated E. coli cell. Um, and, I think, and here's an un, unerupted E. coli cell next to it for, for reference. Now, before we go and talk about uh, specific bacteriophage, I don't want to, I, I want people to understand that bacteria have actually evolved some pretty elaborate defense mechanisms. So they're not just defenseless little creatures. And some of these defense mechanisms you know something about, but maybe you don't know um, why bacteria have them. So many of you who have worked in, in laboratories, or even if you haven't done research yourselves, have perhaps done this in, in a bi biology lab, you've done restriction endonuclease digestions of DNA. So everyone's probably at least familiar with doing an ECHOR1 <coughs> digestion or a BAMH1 digestion of DNA. Well, one of the things I want you to come away with in this class is an appreciation when you see the term ECHOR1 or BAMH1 or HINDI3, these letters actually mean something. They actually reflect the origin of the bacteria. So for instance, ECHOR1 comes from E. coli, strain R, and it was the first enzyme produced. Um, BAMH1 comes from Bacillus, amyloliquefaciens, strain H, and that was the first um, enzyme isolated. But if you look at the DNA that's cleaved by these endonucleases, and remember, this is not a nicking process. This is an actual double-stranded cleavage. They cleave both strands. So, for instance, look here at BAMH1. Here's the recognition site on the top strand, GGATCC. That sequence is a palindrome. Now, not all restriction endonucleases recognize palindromes or cut at palindromes, but most of the ones that you're going to ever run across or use in a laboratory cut these kind of palindromes. And bacteria have a whole different series of classifications of restriction and nucleases that we're not going to get into. We're talking about just what are called type 2 restriction systems. And these typically recognize palindromes. So you can recognize this as a palindrome because this GGATCC itself is not a palindrome like you and I think of, like the word radar, spelled the same forward and backwards. Here you have to look at the other strand. 5' prime to 3' prime, GGATCC. The red arrows indicate where the endonuclease cuts. And it makes sense that these enzymes recognize palindromes and cut at the same site. Because what can happen is that the same uh, molecule of the enzyme BAMH1 can bind to one strand at this GGATCC site. Another molecule of the same enzyme can bind to the other side to the same sequence. And now when it cuts between these two Gs and between these two Gs, that's a double-strand break. So that DNA will actually come apart because the only thing holding it together are the relatively weak hydrogen bonds between this GATC in this overhanging area. This is the defense, this is one of the major defense mechanisms that bacteria have. These are called restriction endonucleases because they were first discovered by their ability to restrict the ability of certain viruses to infect bacteria. 
people realized that you could take certain bacteriophage in the laboratory and infect one strain of E. coli, but not another strain of E. coli. So in one strain that you couldn't infect it, that, was, that infection was said to be restricted. People didn't know at the time what was mediating that restriction. They found out later that the reason why one strain couldn't be lysed by that virus is because when that virus injected its double-stranded DNA, if it had a BAMH1 site, well, no, let's go to ECHO R1 because now we're talking about E. coli. Um, if that bacteriophage injecting its DNA has this GAATTC sequence, it could be cut by an enzyme found in, echo R, in E. coli strains called ECHO R1. Cuts this palindromic sequence here and here. So it's a defense mechanism largely against um, viruses. It's not so effective against plasmids, at least not initially, because remember that plasmids come in typically, and so does transforming DNA, as single-stranded DNA. Um, plasmids perhaps get restricted once they're turned into double-stranded DNA. The other important thing to remember about this is, you know, this sequence in E. coli, uh, this recognized by FOR1, is found quite frequently within the genome of, uh, of, of E. coli. So why is it that the bacterium doesn't degrade its own genetic material? It does this in kind of the same way that you and I don't make um, immune responses against our own molecules. The bacteria have evolved a way to recognize their own DNA as self and not to, not to digest it. So for, for virtually every one of these type 2 restriction endonucleases, there is a partner gene that goes along with them. Um, for every one of these endonucleases, there is a cognate DNA methylase. We talked a little bit about DNA methylase, um, a different class, but still does the same thing, the DAM methylase, that, that methylase the GATC site to mark, uh, to mark DNA. But... There will be an echo R1 digest, or excuse me, an echo R1 restriction enzyme, but there's also an echo R1 methylase, which is going to, when the DNA is replicated in the E. coli genome, is going to put a methyl group on this adenine and on this adenine. That methyl group prevents echo R1 from digesting that DNA. That's self DNA, so at least it's not cutting itself up. But if a foreign piece of DNA gains access to that cell, Unless it's methylated at this A and this A, it's going to be restricted. It's going to be digested by the, by the um, enzyme. So it's a way for the, bac the bacteria have evolved to recognize foreign DNA. And they're doing this by means of palindromes. And so I love palindromes. Uh, and so I don't know how I existed without Google. But, you know, so um, here are some of my favorite palindromes. Um, a man, a plan, a canal... Panama. I wish I was clever enough to come up with these things. I prefer pi. That one's pretty simple. Uh, no one in the class named Natasha this year. That would have been great. Ah, Satan sees Natasha. Spelled the same forward and, and backwards. Um, just a couple more. Damn it, I'm mad. And here's my favorite. This is actually the title of a book. There is somebody who's more fascinated with palindromes than me. He actually wrote a book, and this is the title of the book. Go hang a salami on a lasagna hog. How does somebody come up with this, with this stuff? Um, I don't know. But, okay, enough of that. So that's one system that bacteria can use to um, defend themselves against incoming foreign DNA. Another one is a process that we've talked about a little bit already as well. The toxin-antitoxin system, the TA system. We talked about antitoxin and toxin systems in, in reference to plasmids, low copy number plasmids maintaining themselves by killing cells post-segregationally. Remember that if a bacterium gets away without a copy of the F plasmid, the, the preformed toxin and the antitoxin, the antitoxin breaks down and it kills that, kills that cell. But there are surprisingly a large number of toxin-antitoxin genes, not on plasmids, but on bacterial chromosomes. And people for the longest time couldn't figure out why in the hell you would have this time bomb on the chromosome of, of a bacterium. So what happens is, and the, the reason for these many of these toxin antitoxins is it's a way to limit viral infections in a population. 
So one of the things that's kind of um, an important hallmark of virtually every virus infection is that shortly after a virus infects a cell, one of the first things that it does is it stops host transcription. Because the, back, the virus wants to use all of the resources in that cell, all of the nucleotides, to make its own messenger RNA to express its own proteins. So viruses have, have evolved these elaborate means to stop host transcription. Now, if you're a virus that infects a cell that has a toxin antitoxin, such as this, if you stop the transcription of this system, the first thing that's going to break down is going to be um, the antitoxin. Remember, the antitoxin is more labile. It's broken down. And if you're not transcribing more of the genetic material to make more of the antitoxin, what's left behind is the free toxin to kill the cell. This is apoptosis. This is exactly what you learn about in cell biology um, in our cells, oftentimes mediated via our, via our mitochondria. Not coincidental, I might point out. But, you know, this is the ability of this bacterium infected by a virus to kill itself, to go through programmed cell death, rather than produce a large number of viruses that could now be released into the environment to kill, other, to kill its kin, to kill other cells in that, um, that are genetically identical to it. So here's a, here's a real example of, of, how, this, of how this works. Um, in E. coli, there is a toxin-antitoxin pair of genes known as LSOA and LSOB. Um, one is a toxin, one is an antitoxin. LSOB is the antitoxin. So what happens if a virus infects the cell and stops the transcription of LSOA and LSOB is that the antitoxin should break down more rapidly than the toxin, and the cell would be killed by this toxic molecule, LSOA, before the virus replicates. Very clever system. Viruses are equally clever. So this bacteriophage that we were talking about, the coli phage, just a few minutes ago, the T4 phage, had a gene that nobody could figure out what in that world it did for the longest time. I don't know why they called it DMD. But there is a gene um, in the T4 genome that, when it's expressed, produces a, a protein called DMD, which is the virus equivalent of the antitoxin. So the, the bacterium, you know, its, its transcription has been stopped by the T4 infection. So there's no more transcript of LSOA, LSOB. LSOB protein breaks down. That should release that toxin to kill the cell. But the virus has evolved a way around that. It's evolved a different protein that can now bind to LSOA and serve as a surrogate for the antitoxin. It keeps that protein from exerting its toxic effect, and it allows the phage to replicate. People discovered this because, and I, I stole this from a, a, a paper, but, and so this is the most important point, but the reason they discovered this was they had a DMD minus mutant T4 bacteriophage that had a mutation in that, in that um, gene. And so in that particular case, when T4 infected, you didn't get phage replication because the bacteria would die, because the LSOB would break down, freeing up LSOA, which would kill the cell. Or, or more realistically, LSOA stops transcription. So it breaks down messenger RNA. So you wouldn't get messenger RNA from the, from the phage. So, so that's another system that, that bacteria have to defend themselves uh, against virus. And the third, and I think, I, I'm going to say this is the most important of bacterial defense mechanisms. It's most important in reality, because it's what something that you need to understand. So the system, the CRISPR system, is something that is now, if you're not aware of it, you certainly should be or will be before long, because this is a major biotechnological revolution. It's, it's allowing people to do genetic modification of, of human cells, of eukaryotic cells, that were never possible before. Even just a few years ago, we used to do things like RNAi, um, inter RNA interference. Um, that was short-lived. We could, we could turn down, I, I say we, I never do these experiments. People could turn down gene expression in eukaryotic cells by adding antisense RNA. Now we don't need to do that anymore because of this CRISPR-Cas system, which really um, owes its origins or, or has its origins in bacteria. As a matter of fact, the bacteria that some of you had for your unknown and some of you have all been infected for, Streptococcus pyogenes. 
That's the bacterium that has the CRISPR system that now people are using in terms of biotechnology to modify genetic material in human cells in, in the laboratory. And there's a great ethical debate on whether this CRISPR-Cas system should be used to modify embryonic um, cells. So like um, in vitro fertilization, can you, we theoretically could change the genetic material of, of a fetus at the one or two cell stage so that you could perhaps repair genetic mutations to allow parents who would otherwise not have children because of some genetic mutation um, to now have healthy children. So there's a tremendous ethical debate going on, all based on something that springs from something that we really didn't know anything about until about 2007. So this is a relatively recent um, process. People had realized for a long time that when you looked at the genome sequences of some bacteria and archaea, but not all, you would find these weird little repeat sequences. Um, they were referred to as um, clustered, regularly interspersed palindromic repeats, or CRISPRs. That's what, the al um, that, that's what CRISPR stands for. But people didn't know what, what this was. It turns out that the, that the spacers in here, in between these repeats, are small regions of DNA from viruses that have been defeated by this bacterium. Think of this as a scrapbook of, that the bacteria keeps to remind itself of the viruses that over the millennia it has defeated. Normally what happens when a virus is, infects a bacterium is that what's shown here on the top, you get viral replication um, and you get lots of viruses produced and the cell is lysed. But at some frequency, either because perhaps because the restriction system worked very well or the toxin antitoxin system may have stopped transcription, or maybe the virus was defective. But at some frequency, you get an abortive infection so that the cell actually survives that virus infection. So that cell, having survived the infection, wipes its brow, gives a big sigh, and then what it does is it scrapbooks. It takes a portion of the DNA from that virus that it just beat and chops it up and puts it into this CRISPR system. It's not really just as a reminder. It's going to actually allow this virus to have a type of adaptive immunity. So you and I, you know, if we were infected by mumps or measles as a child, we are immune to, to that virus. So we do this by an adaptive immune system that you should take immunology and, and learn a lot about. Patty's Wallace class is wonderful for that. Bacteria actually have an adaptive immune system as well. They just do it completely different. There are no T cells, B cells, antibodies. Bacteria can't do that. What they do is they use this CRISPR system. So, so here in these um, clustered, regularly interspersed palindromic repeats, this piece of RNA will be transcribed and then processed. So, so here's a transcription of that CRISPR region. It's um, now going to be chopped up and it's going to become associated with proteins that are encoded by genes that are just upstream, these Cas genes, or CRISPR-associated um, genes, the Cas genes. Some of these Cas proteins, proteins are going to associate with small sections, these small CRISPR RNAs, sometimes called small RNA or CR RNA for CRISPR RNA. These RNA molecules now have species or have sequence specificity. So if this bacterium is now infected by a virus that it has seen before somewhere in its evolutionary history, this combination, this ribonucleoprotein combination of the Cas protein with this CRISPR RNA will match up base for base on this incoming virus <coughs> and restrict it. They'll chew it up. They'll, they'll degrade it. So this is a way that um, viruses can be defeated by bacteria. Here's, a, here's another um, cartoon that, that looks at this. Because what you'll hear a lot about is this CRISPR-Cas9. Because the Cas9 protein gene shown here in its entirety is, is what's used biotechnologically now. So, so this protein, which has two really important domains in it. So this is one protein gene shown here. And here are the important domains that are going to accomplish the DNA um, restriction, which we now use, or other people now use, for um, genome editing. So here's the CRISPR system, and here are the repeats. This will be transcribed and now processed into small little bite-sized chunks. Each one of these bite-sized chunks 
reflecting a sequence from a virus that was defeated sometime in the past by, by this bacterium. Now there's a, um, a coming together of the Cas9 protein with some of this uh, RNA, which now serves as a guide. This RNA can now bind to specific incoming DNA, the vir a new virus coming in, and it brings this Cas9 protein with it. And these two domains, the RubC and the HNH domains, are actually the portions of the protein that cleave that DNA. So they'll break that DNA. People now biotechnologically have used this because all you need to do is to change the sequence of this CRISPR RNA to something in, say, the human genome. If you want to modify the human genome at a specific sequence, what you really just need to do is to have this Cas9 protein. And now, rather than give it its choice of all of these various CRISPRs, you give it the choice in the laboratory of just one artificially synthesized CRISPR RNA specific for a specific sequence on the human genome or, you know, whatever, whatever genome you happen to be working with. And that's going to guide that protein to precisely the sequence that you want it to. So it's going to allow you to begin to modify these genes in a living cell. So this is, this is just a remarkable biotechnology. And it's all based on this defense system that, that bacteria have that we didn't know anything about until about 2007. Um, these are, uh, if, if people are interested, I'll give you these slides. I'm just, uh, I'm fascinated by the CRISPR-Cas system, so I was just digging around on the internet and I found some other good, good pictures that I'm going to put in for, for, so next year is going to get even more about CRISPR-Cas than, than you guys are, so don't pay any attention to, to that. And so, um, that's all I want to say about um, the defense systems of, of bacteria for bacteriophage. And so now what we want to walk go into is some, some general materials on viruses in the environment. And just in terms of morphology, bacteriophage are actually pretty cool. Some of them look like corn dogs. There's actually a, there's actually a bacteriophage named corn dog because, because a student, an undergraduate student, saw it and thought, hey, that looks like a corn dog and named it corn dog. Um, and this is, this is it. Uh, but they have all of these different morphologies, different colors. Um, they're, they're a pretty bizarre group of, of little entities. And um, actually, when we, I think we're too close to the end for me to get into this. So when we come back on Monday, we'll, we'll go into this again. So have a good weekend, everybody. I'll see you on Monday.